Are you awake? I thought I heard you get up. Yeah, I'm awake. Sorry, I just can't sleep. Are you thinking about... about him? Yeah, a bit. You should get back to sleep, my love. I'm fine. No, no, it's okay. What else is on your mind? <sighs> I don't know. It seems weird, but I had one of the most vivid dreams of my life. I saw a fox on a snowy mountain, just looking confused and worried. Those eyes, I can't get those eyes out of my head. She was running in the windy snow, looking for something. Do you think it has to do with, with you and what's been going on? I don't know. It was just a dream, Rachel. They're not meant to make sense. A lot's happened the past couple days, that's all. Well, if you're not going to sleep anyway, you should tell me. I want to hear. All right. So, not far from her home, she followed that path to something unexpected. She couldn't stay, though. She had to find her other two children. So she took that path. She followed it towards something ancient. Something with answers. The fox looked high and low, searching for any sign of her cubs. Points of light showed the way to this ancient tree. It was as if each one had a story to tell all their own. The land was trying to tell my story too. I felt like I was right behind her the whole time.
a kid, did you ever do show and tell in your class? Yeah, I, I think I only did it once, when I was in the fourth grade. You know how my life was around then. I wanted to show my class what helped pass the time and distracted me. So I brought a dozen paper cranes I had made. I think I told everyone how badly I wanted to be a bird and fly, embarrassingly enough. Don't be embarrassed. Every kid wants to fly. For me, it was another toy for my dad, a wooden boat. I remember guarding it so carefully in my hands as I walked into class. When I sat down, a group of boys immediately made fun of it. They asked which trash can I found it in, or why an ugly log was my favorite toy. When I got up, I didn't even want to tell them my dad had carved it. I said it was a joke gift my friends had given me. Kids can be so cool. Some of them are. I shouldn't have let them get to me, but it did. It's amazing we bounced back at all. way of putting it. If wood was a canvas, then a carving knife was his paintbrush. Even after working a 50-hour week, even after his hands were more splinters than skin, he would bring home the nicest piece of Alaskan weeping cedar and make me toys. That wooden train was the first toy I can remember, and I loved it. I just knew from a young age I was going to be a lumberjack, like my father. Somehow they could tell I was different. They made fun of how far away I lived. They called my dad a sourdough. I was a blabbermouth as a kid, telling my dad stories I made up for hours. But after that show and tell, I didn't tell him much anymore. He didn't know exactly what was wrong, but his best guess was that the toys he carved weren't cool enough. He carved me a tank and tried to tell me what it was like to be in a real tank as a serviceman. I didn't know your dad was in the military. Yeah, in the army. The sad thing is that I'd pretty much forgotten until just now. There's so much I still don't know about him. I'm sorry. He knows how much you love him. You're going to see him again soon and have some closure, I'm sure.
My teenage years were full of sketching, angst, and trouble. I wasn't popular or unpopular. Maybe just forgettable. I guess that gave me a sense of freedom. So I hung out with crazy kids, doing crazy things, even though I mostly just watched the chaos ensue. We did it all. Put fireworks in mailboxes, hide roadkill in people's garages, break windows of the barber shop in Anchorage. My dad was furious, but he was so busy working he couldn't do much to stop me from going out. I think being an adult means there's no one to stop you making hard decisions. He had to make a living, and he couldn't be in two places at once. Yeah, I realize that now. But at the time, I was sure he was more interested in growing his business than what was going on with me. He was working another late night, and my friends were over, saying how bored they were and how they had come all the way out to my house for nothing. One of them mentioned how that old, ugly beyond belief truck was still in the garage, and how we should take it for a spin. I was only 15, so I kind of fought it for a while. The next thing I knew, we were careening around the mountain path rocks spitting onto the sides of the cliff while my dad's cringeworthy bluegrass blared out the speakers. I drove while my friends were in the back of that yellow and purple truck, throwing beer bottles and trash at anything remotely interesting. Felt like I was soaring in the air with borrowed wings. But all good things have endings. A cop outside of Eagle River pulled us over after he saw us in a bottle rocket into someone's yard. What followed was a long night of talking to disappointed adults and feeling smaller than ever.
After he drove me home from the police station, I blew up at him, saying how I never wanted to be like him, how I was going to be someone and leave that hick icebox for good. He just looked forward at the road with tired eyes. I took out that bluegrass tape from the cassette deck and chucked it out the window. In my sage teenage wisdom, I thought I had proved the ultimate point, but my dad had a different idea. He slammed the brakes, slowly bowed his head while gripping the steering wheel, and finally looked at me. All he said, like it was a polite request, was, make this right. I sat there in silence, fuming, but I eventually got out and combed every square inch of the woods, muttering profanity after profanity. I found it 30 minutes later, near a small waterfall off the road. I went back to the truck, put the wet tape back in, and sure enough it worked. We didn't speak another word to each other the rest of the night. Wow, I knew you were a crazy teenager, but... It's hard to believe, isn't it? It surprises me too. It's like I didn't really know who that kid was back then. I bet my dad thought the same thing over and over. It's almost like he was saying, make this right to himself, more than to me.
My friends would laugh about that night and talk about how crazy it was. And I laughed along, pretending it didn't bother me. But it did. I imagined my friends growing old in the bush, unable to find that thrill in those godforsaken ice fields. It's like those mountains were a literal wall, keeping me from leaving, where all I would have to look forward to are lumber yards and evening beers. I had to climb over. That was my only goal for a long time. If there was some way I could take my love of drawing and turn it into a way of escape, nothing would make me happier. I wanted to create instead of tearing trees down. I wanted to move to the lower 48, not because I hated it there in Alaska, but I hated the idea of it. It's like all of that spite inside me had created this monster which followed me around my whole teenage years. I put so much energy into doing what others didn't expect of me. Why did I do that? There is one fact you're forgetting, though. If you didn't have that fire in you, we probably would have never met. You're absolutely right. Maybe the destination is all that matters in the end. But then why am I awake? Why am I seeing this fox go on her journey? And why can't I stop thinking about my dad?
On our property, there were old abandoned pieces of a shed and car long left unused. I used to ask him all the time who those people were that left all this junk. And I'm sure he got so tired of hearing it that he made up some elaborate stories how a brown bear ate them and haunted the woods afterwards. What's funny is I think it made those people seem more real. Growing up thinking they were still hanging out like they couldn't say goodbye. I used to tell my friends how I could swear I saw spirits move near the water, and that always freaked them out. I guess it didn't bother me, because the way I saw it, they were normal people with old cars and sheds, just trying to figure out how to survive and be happy in the middle of nowhere. It was a cool thought that they didn't want to leave, but you know, I was a weird kid. Well... You had good company since those ghosts like living in a place where they were brutally devoured. distant, at the times when I detested him the most, he kept reaching out. For a year straight, he asked me every week when we were going camping. I thought he was just dense. Eventually to shut him up, I agreed. We carried out the worn lawn chairs from the garage and set up a cinder block campfire at the site we'd always used behind the house. We walked down the mountain path talking in the warm sunshine we only got a couple months of the year. Those three obsidian rocks shimmered alongside the shore, almost like sparklers pressed against a dark window. I'll never forget that wet stone on my feet, or how those massive mountains looked even bigger in the lake's reflection. I felt small, but grateful. As the sun set, my dad found something I hadn't seen for a long time the tree where I'd made my first carving when I was six. I hadn't even carved it. My dad had helped me, but I still called it my tree. Something about seeing my name there made me open up, and we talked about everything that night in that old camouflage tent. I told him how much I love sketching and design, and how it would be a dream to study architecture in Seattle. I told him how I didn't get along with my friends much anymore, but that I didn't mind being alone. He told me he was there for me, and he joked that if all he had to do was write my name on a tree to finally get me to talk, he would have left me carved logs with novels on them in front of my room every morning. <laughs> I don't know why it took me that long to realize it, but it was then I knew how much he had sacrificed for me.
we were happiest underneath the evergreens. We decided it was time to finally map out the hundreds of acres we lived on just to pass the time during the summer. He was only free in the evenings, so I would spend the day wasting time on dial-up internet and sketching, and then we would rush into the woods, pen and map in hand, before evening fell. Sometimes, the aurora borealis would cast a cold green glow on the mountainside, and we would finish our route underneath a twilight sky. Sometimes, I was lonely during those summer days, but there was comfort in the routine. A lot of teenagers aren't looking for the daily grind, though. There's nothing wrong with wanting to get out, to leave your childhood home. You wanted to progress, to make something of yourself. Yeah, you're right. That house. I'm sure it's the same as how I left it. But then why does it feel so different? I doubt you're the only adult to have looked back and asked that question. My dad built a lot of stuff in his free time. If he wasn't watching fly fishing or reading Tom Clancy novels, he was carving something. He made tons of birdhouses. Not that he was into bird watching, but I think he really missed working and adding on to the home. If he couldn't afford the time to build onto our own house, he would have to settle with watching birds move into their little homes. We kept an old mattress in the bed of that ugly yellow truck. So we would drive it deep into the woods and then watch the birds fly into their houses while the sun set. Usually it was accompanied by venison jerky or a cold coke, but not a lot of talking, which is how we both liked it. Thank you.
I don't think the first tree could work at all without the music by Josh Kramer. And his music, it's actually publicly available to license. And so it was affordable for me since this was a hobby project. And it's something I like to tell new indie developers all the time. Like, you can't afford that composer. You can't afford a full-time programmer. You need to cut corners and finish your game. And the way to do that is to use these amazing publicly available assets that anyone can purchase and license and so his music is it's incredible and I actually haven't talked to him that much I've just emailed him but um his music was nominated for most emotional music at the emotional game awards in France and he's just a really nice guy and I think there's so much amazing content out there that if you're thinking of making a game like look around and see what you can make work on a tight budget because it worked really well for the first tree Earlier I said I just love going through video games and exploring, like looking at every nook and cranny and just trying to find little details. And I think that started because in middle school and high school, I would make mods for my favorite games, namely Jedi Knight, Jedi Outcast, and Far Cry. And I loved like this huge world of mod makers who would make these levels and it'd be like the most random creative things. And I would just love exploring, usually multiplayer levels by myself. So even though I went to college for film, before that, like before high school, I was making video games and mods, and it was, it was my favorite thing in the world. I made a ton of different levels. I made an abandoned space hotel with a dance floor and cafeteria. I made a haunted campground with cabins and tents. I made this whole city with like the first ever day-night cycle with running showers and stuff in the hotel and the, and the apartment buildings. And I just loved making those mods. And I think that carries over to my game, The First Tree, and also the one before that, Home is Where One Starts, which is very, it's, it's exploration. You're just looking around and appreciating the details.
there stood nearby, unfazed, like nothing was wrong. My dad is dead, and he's never coming back, Rachel. I can tell you these stories, but I can never reminisce with him again. He can never hold a grandchild that we'll probably never be able to have. I can never talk to him again, and I'll never be able to say I'm sorry. For everything. It was really important to me that the wolf in this story that takes the fox's cubs, that it wasn't explained at all. Like, it's just this this entity that's in the background. And of course, it's, it's supposed to represent something bigger than a wolf or even the fox. It's supposed to represent, like, the specter of death. And it doesn't, it comes when you least expect it. There's no justification. He's just there, always watching. Joseph, you can't go to sleep feeling like this. I'm sorry for everything, and I know you need space, but I'm here for you. You don't need to feel so lost. Joseph, have I ever told you what my mother was like? Hello, my name is Elise Whaley, and I was the voice actress for Rachel. I'm also David's wife. Um, so that was convenient for working together. I was actually the voice actress for his first game, Home is Where One Starts, and I guess that I did a good enough job that David wanted me back, so I did the voice acting for this one as well. 
David definitely um, coached me through it because I'm pretty inexperienced when it comes to that. Home is Where One Starts was my first time ever doing voice acting of any kind. And we watched a lot of trailers of movies we liked to get the voice right of female leads who were talking in the trailer and, and try to mimic that and bring that into the game. Uh, so that had the right kind of feel and the right kind of atmosphere for the voice. Uh, my character actually is the same character from Home is Where One Starts. Um, if you've played that game, you probably connected that together. And this is her um, probably about 15 years later, maybe 20 years later um, in this game. I was happy to revisit the character of Rachel. Um, we kind of leave her in an ambiguous spot and home is where one starts. It definitely ends on a hopeful note, but there's not a lot of details. And in this game, you see that she's able to move on through a lot of her issues that she had from her abusive home and be able to start her own family and start a new cycle um, without that abuse, which I think is really inspiring. You know what it's like not to have a mom at home. And you know how hard that made my childhood. What helped me was watching the birds in the morning before the school bus came. <laughs> I thought that my mother was one of those birds. And it made me want to be free like her. My mom taught me how to fold origami cranes while she was in the hospital. So I told myself I would fold one every day until I could fly myself. I think we both have always loved animals. And for me, that love started with a dog. Sometimes this Rottweiler would come up to our property line and wait at the fence for me, but only once in a while. I was sure to check every day immediately after school, and it usually ended in disappointment. I would even steal money from my passed out dad just so I could buy these off-brand dog biscuits. Even when she did stop by, she never went beyond the fence. Why was she so scared? So it's always interesting working with your spouse because, especially on a creative project, because they want your feedback, but it's something that's also dear to their heart, and they're dear to your heart, and you definitely don't want to hurt their feelings. So I was a little nervous when David asked me, he had finally finished writing the script, and he asked me to go over it and, and see what I thought. And I had minored in English. I majored in art, but I minored in English. So I felt like I had a little bit of experience. But I was definitely like a little scared because you don't want to be too harsh, but you also want to be honest. And it was the biggest relief when I read the script. And I was like, oh, good. My husband's a good writer. I don't have to change that much about this. Just a few like grammatical things. And um, that was just like the biggest relief for me because it, it can be a tricky balance um, working with your spouse and, and making sure that that honesty is there but also that that love and the support is there as well. I think my dad was the opposite of your dad in almost every way, except he was in the military as well. He coped with alcohol of every kind. The trailer started falling apart, he got angry, and I withdrew. More and more I became the weird, quiet kid who made lots of origami birds and carried talk biscuits around. I think we were pretty similar when it came to being the weird kids. And that same sincerity in college was one of the reasons I was so drawn to you. So we're talking about Home is Where One Starts a lot, so if you haven't played that game, maybe this doesn't make as much sense, or maybe this is a little plug that you should go play it. But um, in that game, it actually features one of my artworks. I work as an artist and um, paper cutting, actually. And David used one of my artworks as a graffiti stencil in Home is Where One Starts that's against the wall of this uh, shack. And it actually shows up again in the first tree, just a fragment of it. The first tree, the title actually comes from one of my artworks that I made back in 2015, I want to say. And I made this artwork um, while I was pregnant with our first child. And it had a lot of meaning for me and David actually helped me come up with the title. And he, he asked it because I was really struggling. I was like, I have no idea what to call this. And I always go to David for title ideas and to bounce ideas off of him. And that's like the only way I can ever come up with a title is by talking with him. So we were talking back and forth and looking at this artwork and, and he said, well, 
what kind of like movies or shows were you watching while you're making the artwork? Because my work's pretty tedious, so sometimes I'll watch a show or do some Netflix binging while I'm creating it. And I was like, oh, I actually watched Tree of Life um, a ton. And then we're like, Tree of Life. And we started thinking more about that and then arrived at the first tree. So it started off as one of my artworks and then became a part of David's art, which I think is really cool that we were able to share that title. You have strength, Joseph, and you're not as alone as you think. It's all just so pointless, just waiting for life to happen. It's like having the home I always wanted is cursed out of my reach. The thought of being a parent myself, how could I do that when I couldn't even be a good son? I'm sorry, I know what you're saying. I just don't know how things will work out. These quiet hours will turn into years. We'll wonder which roads passed us by. Then we'll forge a new road, together. Besides, I discovered for myself that one fateful morning where any hopeful road leads to. There may be thorns and mist, but it always leads to the same thing. And what's that? Family. I'm so glad that you're part of my family, Rachel. And I'm glad you're part of mine. A question I get a lot is, why a fox? And it ties into just how important family is for me. And Fox is actually a family name from my wife's side, from Elise. And she always heard about the legacy of the Fox family. And because of that, growing up, it was her favorite animal. She even made these two wooden foxes for our wedding cake toppers. So I thought it would be cool to have that animal in the game while these two people are having this conversation in the middle of the night. knew her last cub would be waiting for her at the first tree. She was almost there. The rain cascaded onto the jade valley where the entrance to the tree was. Life was protected there, because that's where life began. It was now only a mother and a daughter left. Items from my life still dotted the ground as she moved closer to her destination. And destiny.
Usually what catches people's attention of the first tree is the visuals, of course. And I was inspired by a lot of people making these levels. The second level is inspired by just these beautiful autumn photos of a real forest. And um, this level, the Jade Valley, is inspired by the artwork of Heather Penn, who did the Overland games. I just love those greens with a lot of gray in it. I love the strong vignettes in the corners of the frame. And of course, this environment pack was made by the, the very talented uh, Swedish designer, Mikael Gustafsson. And of course, his initial designs inspired me and I was able to build off of that. And I'm really grateful that he allowed his environment pack to be made publicly available. At the end of high school, I felt something I hadn't felt in a long time. Drive. I looked into the best architecture schools on the west coast and got a dose of reality when looking at other students' portfolios and the high cost of tuition. I still wanted to be something, to be the next Alvaro Siza, and to make those thousands of sketches worth something in my grand history. But now even an internship sounds impossible. Siza helped me understand how essential emotion is in architecture. And he also said, light is the real composer of space. I like to think these glints of light, like not finding a job, or even a strange dream about a fox, are something I should be thankful for. Even if the illuminated space is something I'm less than comfortable with. By now you've probably caught on to some of the themes I love to explore in these stories. And the big one is of this tree, the first tree on earth. And a lot of people have asked me, what, what does that mean? Why a tree? And basically it boils down to this delicate balance between nature and its relationship with life and death. And I love these stories where they put like these uh, microscopic relationships like something of like a father and a son and juxtapose it next to this epic story of like the creation of the universe and the first tree on earth and how they can be equally as important because in my mind like my family is as important as like the creation of the earth and it reminds me of like some of the stories I love like The Road by uh, Cormac McCarthy or The Tree of Life by Terrence Malick Basically, I wanted to make sure the player felt that there was a higher power than themselves and that there was something watching over them as they went through this story. My dad was super supportive with my college plans. To a point. Things were okay until this terrible accident happened. I guess a forklift flipped over due to a bad axle and it crushed one of the workers there. My dad didn't eat for days, even though he wasn't directly involved, it devastated him. Not only did it hurt the business, but it just freaked him out. He would talk in his sleep, muttering things about firing people and saying sorry. One fateful day he approached me, said that since my school search wasn't going well, I should finally be a man and take over the family business. He said one day he was going to die and that all of his work, sacrifice, and even that man's life would be wasted in vain. I just lost it. Teenage me just exploded at the thought. I screwed up. I said things I shouldn't have. He was having a crisis, and I pretty much spit in his face.
Was that the last time you talked to him? No, I called on holidays, and he would call on my birthday. I guess we acted like nothing ever happened, which was stupid. I didn't want to ask about his lumberyard, and I'm sure he didn't want to ask about my job search. I never went back and visited. I think the last conversation we had was about what movies we had seen and what exactly a best boy is in the credits. I thought he would be here so much longer. In the distance, the first tree illuminated the wasteland. She couldn't go home anymore. She did the only thing she was capable of. Moving forward. My dad died alone in the middle of the wilderness. I should have been talking to him more. I should have done a lot of things differently. If the first tree on earth brought life with it, if it taught the birds to sing and fly and showed saplings how to grow, what could it do for us? Obviously, this is a really emotional part, but I'm going to talk through it anyway. A lot of people correctly identify that Journey was like a huge inspiration for the first tree. And this part, it is like a callback to that part where you're climbing up the mountain with your friend you don't know, and it just, it just gets snowier and snowier, and you just keep going, and then eventually you collapse. And that part, that made a huge impact on me. And I actually, I don't even own a PlayStation three or four. I had the, I rented a PlayStation from like a rent -a center right after uh, completing Home is Where One Starts just because I'd heard so much about it. And everyone was right, it was a very impactful game and it and definitely inspired the first tree. truth. Each of us have our own journey to the first tree, but sometimes I'm not sure I'm ready to take that first step. You already have my love.
guess her journey was over. But I have no idea. It was only a dream. A distraction from tomorrow. I don't think dreams normally bring back to memory so many important feelings. Maybe it was just a dream, but it was also a gift. Yeah, I suppose. But tomorrow we're getting on a plane to the last place on Earth I want to be. The only person that would have made the trip worth it is gone. You're going to see him and be with him one last time before you say goodbye. I have one last quote for you by Emerson, sealed in an imaginary letter from me to you. It is the secret of the world that all things subsist and do not die, but only retire a little from sight and afterward return again. Go to sleep, my love. We have a big day tomorrow, but I'll be there with you every step of the way. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Good night, Rachel. Good night, Joseph. You're probably thinking, what is going on? And that was definitely my intention for this epilogue part of the first tree. This is my favorite part. This is the part I'm most proud of. And it definitely, like, it's supposed to evoke this, like, what is going on? Where am I? I was not expecting this. When I was marketing and blogging about making the game, I never showed anyone this part. I never told anyone. I never shared screenshots. I wanted it to be a complete surprise. And I also wanted it to feel a little creepy because it's totally inspired by those nights where you wake up in the, in the middle of the night and you can just hear the sounds of the wind outside the house and you can't sleep. So you walk around in this like twilight stupor. And I would say the whole first part of this game where you play as the fox, its whole purpose is to set up for this conclusion. So yeah, I would encourage you to look around and see how many things you recognize from the earlier part of the game. I tried hard to foreshadow this epilogue just because I wanted it to be a surprise, but I didn't want it to feel too out of place that it would be humorous. And so Joseph earlier in the game, he would say things like, I felt like I was right behind the fox the whole time. In my mind, the camera perspective acts as a metaphor for who the player is, what they're seeing, with if the camera represents Joseph, or just like that, that video game trope of having the camera follow you. I guess the big question I wanted the player to ask themselves, is this a dream as well? And if so, does that even matter?
I tried hard to foreshadow this epilogue just because I wanted it to be a surprise, but I didn't want it to feel too out of place that it would be humorous. And so Joseph, earlier in the game, he would say things like, I felt like I was right behind the fox the whole time. In my mind, the camera perspective acts as a metaphor for who the player is, what they're seeing, if the camera represents Joseph, or just like that, that video game trope of having the camera follow you. I guess the big question I wanted the player to ask themselves, is this a dream as well? And if so, does that even matter? I purposefully fade out the crosshair in the middle of the screen because I wanted it to be a direct callback to the camera following the fox in the first five levels of the first tree. I wanted it to go for that gut reaction that this was very familiar, yet totally in a different world. Thank you for making it to the end of my game. 
and I hope you enjoy the personalized message that is featured on the trunk of this tree. It's a message submitted by another player that's retrieved from a database, and it's retrieved at random. And I did this because I wanted people, even if they feel alone through trials of death, that there is a community, an invisible community supporting each other. So thanks for playing.